It is that time of the month where real base bring in their series of listing presentations with the best of the best. And my co-pilot today, Frank Greff, who is the CEO of Real Base, also known as Campaign Track, also known as Real Hub. Yep. Um, so less uh, confusing soon. <laughs> but, but just for, 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 for the record, the long-term the long-term name is going to be uh, Real Base. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, just as about 20 years of brand equity with uh, Campaign Track and five years with Real Hub. So it will take a little bit of time before everybody recognizes Real Base. So for, for the short term, we'll have uh, three different names to go by just to confuse everybody. So it looks like we've got about 70 people live so far. Hey, Tom, I wanted to just add something um, today. I'd love to um, have five minutes at the end for everybody to have Q&A. So if everybody um, during today's session has any questions for Maria, um, please pop them in the chat and we'd, we'll spend five minutes at the end. How does that sound, Tom? Beautiful. So to keep us on track, uh, Frank, yep. what time should we be aiming to uh, finish the total event with questions? Uh, with questions, I reckon we'll aim to finish around about 12, I think is what we have in the diary. Where we so we're going to do short, sharp, fast questions in the chat box. The great agent on the other side of the screen, for those who are watching, Maria Casarino, who is from Stone at Seaforth, one of the business owners there, and also one of the best agents in Australia. Today, Maria is going to give us an opportunity to do a deep dive backstage view of her listing presentation. And in particular, because as we spoke about yesterday, Frank and Maria, we all, we all know that fundamentally to win a listing, people got to like you, right? People got to trust you. People got to feel like they've been listened to. You've got to end up solving their problem and you've got to fundamentally get them to believe that you're going to get them more money. And trust is your superpower. So the truth is every conversation we have seems to have these common things in that relationship. But the thing that I like about Maria is she backs herself so much. She backs herself so much. And we're going to talk about this in this video where she actually gives people an option on what they want to pay her. And they actually make the decision on what they're going to pay her after the property has been sold. And in New South Wales, we call that the exchange of contracts. So welcome, Maria, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. What an intro. <laughs> I sort of like to slip under the radar a little bit. So, yeah, hearing those things about yourselves, it's a little bit overwhelming, to be honest. But, yeah, thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. So, Maria, what I want to speak to you about is just your approach to, you know, getting listings. You are, uh, and I only found out yesterday, you, you did, you know, some, some people say some of the best gifts in life come badly wrapped. And you did your own, you had your own health scare um, with cancer. It's actually not a scare. You had cancer and that would have been an ordeal. And after that, it's when your real estate life sort of really started taking off. I got that impression, or am I wrong there? No, you're 100% right. Um, I guess they say that anyone who's been through something like cancer, um, you come back different. Uh, I have to agree with that. It was like a rebirthing for me in real estate. Um, that life experience uh, opened my mind um, to sort of deal with things in a very different way. So, yes, I've, I've been a very different real estate agent since my ordeal. And I bet you, Maria, that you've gone to listing presentations and there's definitely been, I mean, you must have cancer vendors all the time. It's such a, it's such a common disease um, yeah. that um, you must have a, an extra layer of empathy and understanding on when you find out, hey, by the way, my husband or my wife's got cancer or my child's got cancer or whatever. It, it, is, it is an unspoken language. Anyone who's been through it, you get it. And yes, there's definitely, it, it's definitely an instant rapport builder. If they haven't had it, they know someone who's had it. Um, the other thing for me is that everyone in my area pretty much knows I had it um, because it was in the media. There was, um, you know, petitions and fights and everything else associated with my illness at the time. So I can't, I had to embrace what happened to me and I had to actually show that it was a sign of strength. 
um, like a phoenix and a rebirth. That's sort of how I see myself. So, yeah, it's not something that I can hide from. Um, I've had to embrace it. Uh, and, yeah, definitely there's, you do, you do get a sense of, of, of understanding um, a lot of people's situations. And I guess as a real estate agent, I see myself as someone who's helping, I'm helping my clients move on to that next phase of their life. Um, where, whether it's upsizing, downsizing, you know, whatever the case may be. And I guess when someone tells you you're going to die and they are about to rip your life from you, it gives you, it gives you a different strength um, and fearlessness. I think that's a big word for me. I'm definitely fearless. And none of that would have happened um, and I wouldn't be able to deal with the hard conversations and I wouldn't be able to deal with some of the things that I have to deal with in business every day if I hadn't gone through that. Well, I'm glad we're talking about this because at the moment, people in some shape or another are going through chaotic and scary times due to the lockdowns, right? So as we speak to you, we have a large part of Australia in lockdown, right? Um, I would probably have a guess at least half of Australia, maybe a touch more. And I think anyone watching this right now, and I have a lot of conversations with agents sort of feeling stressed, overwhelmed and anxious. I think the way you look at the problem is the problem. The truth of the matter is, I would envisage, Maria, that this COVID lockdown is nothing compared to the time that you're in treatment and the uncertainty of surviving during a life-threatening illness like cancer. Would I be right? Oh, absolutely. Um, look, obviously, I, I see I see the lockdown and everything as an inconvenience and, and it's uncomfortable. But like I said, when you're staring death down that, you know, that laneway, um, yeah, this is this is nothing. But in, in saying that, it is a big deal to everyone, and it's how you deal with it. It's the strength in your mind. It's keeping yourself busy. It's doing all those different things that are going to get us through this. Um, again, it's adaption. We, we live in a world that's constantly changing. We always have to adapt, and I guess this is COVID's definitely that point, right? Mm. Now, now, Maria, before we move on to the listing presentation off camera yesterday you said something about a marketing initiative that you did that sort of pretty much put you on the map and created a permanent brain tattoo of you into your community. Could yeah. I get you to explain what it was? Because it appears that that is actually something that probably still helps you to this day get listings. Um, yeah, so what I actually did was I think, and, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's really good advice. Sponsorship is a big word. Um, so I sponsor my local primary school, which actually happened to be the school that I went to. Um, and by doing that, they gave me a signboard um, to put at the front of the school to sort of indicate that, that I was obviously sort of sponsoring them. Um, thought I always like to do think outside the square when it comes to marketing. I don't want to do the normal. So with my marketing, I had a photograph of myself and a photograph of me as a kindergarten child. And um, it just sort of struck a, it struck a nerve with everyone. It was put in quite a prominent spot. So on a busy road um, in my core area. And even to this day, that sign's now been gone for two years, but it was there for seven Wow. Um, I won't get into the details as to why it went down because that was thanks to an agent putting a complaint into council. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> anyway, but people still think it's there yeah. because they've driven past it so many times. It's true. It's been tattooed in their mind that they think it's still there. So just by sort of tying in my local ties to the, uh, to, to the area and just, it, as I said, it was you know, a, sign, a cheap signboard, obviously there's more around and, and school sponsorship's not just about funds. It's about being present there. It's about doing what you can for them. I would always, you know, I, I go in there and talk to the kids and, you know, they come and see me. I'm at their cake days. I'm at their whatever it is, um, you know, making coffees, whatever the case may be. But I think that's a really, in relation to pros prospecting, this is a people business. So it can't just be around... Um, socials and everything else, I think we need to get out there and give our time as well to the community. Yeah, Frank, before you move on to that presentation, I've got to tell you, I see a lot of real estate agents that tell me 
they love community sponsorship. Obviously, they got their commercial reasons. Mm -hmm. But I think, like, if you, like, obviously, you know, Maria believed, you know, went to that school. She had some skin in the game, right? It meant something. And everyone's got a connection to things when they're younger, right? Um, but, you know, whether it's the school or whether it's the surf club, if you're into surfing, Lutzi that we had a few weeks ago, who, you know, would sponsor the rugby club. It's really good to actually put some money into something that you love and adore mm. um, because I have to tell you, if you don't invest that money into community, you're going to be paying tax anyway, right? So you turn around, so I'm going to be paying tax on that money. Second thing is, um, I mean, how many parents are involved in these organisations. Like, I don't know, Maria, I mean, the number of parents at that school, there must have been hundreds of parents. Yeah, yeah. And then obviously we're talking about a long period of time. So, as I said, I, you know, you think of that school, you think of me. Um, so, yeah, it, it's something that, as I said, like you said before, it's been tattooed in people's minds and, you know, didn't think that it would have the impact it had, but God, it did. As I said, people still think it's there and it's been gone for two years. Okay, now I want to turbocharge into my bit, the bit I want to sort of dig deep in, Frank, is the the commission approach that, that Maria has. I know that you do send out, do you send a digital pre-list before you go to it? Um, so the way that I, obviously, if I get an appointment, I don't, we've got the digital pre-list. I don't send that. I actually take a, so I can leave that with them. So they've got, um, you know, material about me. Um, you know, my sales, all that kind of stuff. So, yes, there is a pre-list kit, um, but I take that with me to the appointment. Um, then I will spend a good hour with the clients, um, firstly going around the house and then sitting down and talking to them. Um, again, I try and keep my mouth shut um, and listen and sort of take in what they want to tell me because that's obviously then going to help me um, put together what I think is a listing presentation that will suit them um, and what they're after. So, again, I think agents talk too much about themselves um, and need to sort of listen a little bit more. Then um, after I come back to the office, depending on the situation, I'll either send an electronic proposal um, or alternatively I'll sit down with them again and go through that proposal with them in person. Um, for me, you've really it's really about your personality. It's about their personality. You really need to, uh, my listing presentation these days, my SARS campaign generally um, is very much about psychology and trying to understand the human on the other end um, and how am I going to get them to listen to me? How am I going to get them to trust me when it does come time that I think if you listen to them first, um, and you build that trust, then when I need to talk and when I need to, to give them a message, they'll actually be responsive of it. Um, it's not scripted, it's not dialogued, and it obviously has to be built over a period of time. Um, but yeah, like I said, my listing presentations, I'm normally in there a good hour um, for, for that, to, to, just to make sure that I'm you know, getting them to get a feel for me and I'm getting a feel for them. Now, I wanna ask you, Commission. Explain your scheme of commissions in real estate. It's I have heard of similar schemes, but I particularly love to dig deep on the scheme that you have because you actually get it finalised after the offer and acceptance, not before the offer and acceptance. Yes. So um, I like to sort of go in and say, let's take it out of the equation. So. Um, I suggest a range, which is basically in line with what I think is the cheapest end of, of um, what's happening in my market to a top end range. So I'm putting I'm putting my head on the line to actually getting paid a cheap fee, um, what I consider to be a cheap fee, um, obviously for what we do. There are agents out there that obviously will always go cheaper. Um, and then, you know, and as I said, I have a lot of clients who'll have a bit of a chuckle and go, doesn't everyone pay that, you know, don't they pay that lower end of the fee? But with the amount of work that we put into each listing, whether it's being the preparation, um, whether it's being um, the communication we give them, the reporting, everything, um, by giving our 100% and the client knowing they get that 100%, at the time of exchange is when we ask them to then tell us what that fee is. Um, and as I said, at the time of exchange, 
you've worked your butt off to get the highest price that you can for them. They've been with you through the process to see, because I'm very, um, my, all my strategies are very transparent. Um, so again, one thing I really believe in is how you deliver your message. Um, the tone that we give our clients when we're sitting there talking to them, whether it's on the phone or in person, um, I feel that lines you up for whether they're going to trust you or not. If you're telling the truth, then it's easier to deliver that message um, and your owner's going to believe you. So, um, again, always trying to sort of spend as much time as you can with them. But then by the time you get to that exchange, you've signed the contract, um, you've exchanged. And, again, I also, when I exchange a contract, I like to get, particularly at an auction, I'll get my owner and I'll get the vendor and the purchaser there and I'll do an old school exchange where they get the contracts and they sort of, so it's like they're actually handing over their house to someone, yeah. that kind of thing. As I said, everything I do is very emotional. Yeah. Um, I also tell purchasers that they'll get a handover by my vendor before yeah. a settlement. Mm -hmm. So again, there's lots of touch points. There's lots of people touch points in the process and particularly if you're buying a family home um, that, you know, so they're, they're feeling like their house is going to go to someone who, who loves it because obviously that's what we've told them as well. Um, so at that time when they've exchanged and the champagne's flowing and they've met the purchaser, they've just handed over the contract, it's like, okay, well, now we'll need to talk about that commission. Um, so you've done all this work all the way up and they've seen how much, how hard, you, you know, you, the house is looking amazing. They never thought it could look that good. So we really do go in and do a lot of that work for them because they can't visualise that. That's our job. Um, and then, as I said, it's just an easy thing at the time of settlement um, that they, as I said, we send out an email straight after. And we say we need to finalise um, the, the formalities around commission and fees and figures and things like that. Um, and sort of tell them, you know, again, reiterate that range and, and ask them what they would like to pay us. Uh, as I said, at that point in time, they're feeling great. Their house is sold. They got a lot of money for it. Um, you know, they've seen what we've done throughout. And as I said, I think, um, you know, I, I probably only get 2% of my vendors that are giving me the bottom end of that range. Um, my average commission rate has skyrocketed since doing this. Um, and again, it's, it's, you know, a lot of people also like the incentive-based scheme. And I sort of say to clients, this is what it's like. It's the incentive-based. If you feel that, you know, you, at least when you know what you've got, then you know what you can pay us. So if they're not happy with the price, they might end up on the lower end. M Maria, the, the, just roughly the gap between lower and higher end is, a, is 1%, you think? Um, 0.7%. Point seven. Point seven. Yeah. Point seven. Okay. And um, um, I know that I've got another client um, called Chris Hassel at Buxton's at Bentley who uses something similar and he calls it a flexi fee. Um, and he says to me, one of the secrets to it is that along the campaign, you've got to get them to be happy every step of the way. Because if they've said yes, there's because he keeps he says he says that this is the question that he says Maria he says is there anything else I should be doing for you right now is there anything else I should be doing so he's getting all these yeses and, and it's against human nature to get 10 yeses and then to say oh no I'm giving you the low fee yeah. Yeah. can you relate to that yeah absolutely um, that's why I said by it, it, it it's a process you can't sort of if you're going to do this fee and then not communicate not do reports not then don't do it because you'll end up at the bottom. Yeah. Um, you really need to, as you said, work hard, um, satisfy, over, you know, don't under deliver, mm. but give give a lot more than what they've ever expected. Um, you know, answer phones all the time. Like I'm, I'm one who will always answer my phone no matter what time of day. But again, these days people have respect and don't ring you at silly hours. Um, emails, are, I'm answering them all the time. So. You know, if your vendor sees that you're doing that, they know that you're doing that to their purchases as well. So they know that you're working hard. So, you know, I've had clients say to me, um, yes, Maria, I'm picking you because everyone says you work really hard. Um, you know, you're, you're always there for them. And that's the thing is that we do this every day. Vendors, purchases, they don't. They rely on us to give them the professionalism and the guidance 
Um, so, you, you, you know, I, I say to my vendors, I'll hold your hand the whole way. Um, any questions you've got, I'm here to answer them. But if you're a good agent, you'll preempt and do those things before they have to ask you those questions. Maria, and then I'm going to hand over to, to Frank. The one, the one thing I want to ask you is in the current environment, uh, you're in, for those of you that are watching this, I want to let you know that Maria Seaforth is New South Wales in Sydney, and um, it's in a uh, in an LGA area that is not affected um, with one of the strict lockdowns, but regardless, it is a, it's Sydney and it is locked down. Can I ask you, at the moment, what kind of conversations or is there any tips or ideas you can share that you're having with your clients in your pipeline that are delaying coming onto the market? Um, I mean, I would presume that there's a group of people that are terrified by COVID and simply don't want to come onto the market. Would that be fair? Um, yeah, there definitely is. Uh, obviously, for us at the moment, we've got very low stock levels um, and you know, we're seeing really, you know, fantastic prices as, as most of Sydney is, is doing. I guess my strategy, and it's funny, I had this meet, this, this chat with my, my sales team this morning in our, in our sales meeting. But what I'm finding is that if I'm, I'm basic, if, if we don't know how long we're going to be doing this for, we could be doing these one-on-one -on -one appointments the whole of spring. So if that's the case and we're not going back to open houses, how many listings are you going to be able to hold? If we're having to basically do six hour open days, pretty much is what's happening with us at the moment. So again, I guess one, one way of, of talking to vendors is saying, you know, if you'd like, you know, there's nothing on the market at the moment. Obviously we, we are doing the off market start with and then going on market. But what I'm finding is, is most of my clients are going, there's nothing out there, let's go. Let's just go now. Um, and, and, you know, they're either moving out of their homes or whatever the case may be to enable us to facilitate those inspections. The other thing is, is that, you know, you can always use the line that, um, you know, I can only hold so much, so much stock. So if you want to be, if you want me to give you that 100%, then I'm going to need a commitment from you earlier rather than later. Um, because we do, you know, every, everyone's, everyone's waiting for lockdown to end before they come on. The other thing I'm finding is that I'll say to my clients, let's sign up now. Let's get things organised. Let's, you know, clean the gardens. Let's paint the house. We're able to do those things with the trades. Um, and then what I'm finding is that once they're actually in that space, they themselves are mentally already in the campaign. They're already there. So they don't want to wait until lockdown is announced or whatever the case may be. It's like, let's go. I so like it's, it's going a different way. So right, Maria, I'm absolutely convinced if you get someone moving even with a small incremental decision, they're on the bus. They're on they're the on, bus. Yep. Right. Yeah, I've, had, I've had a number of clients who have said, oh, we'll wait till lockdown. And then I've said, okay, well, let's get this painted. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's get the stylist in because she's obviously being more flexible with time. Um, and, and as soon as they see the house looking amazing, they're like, what are we waiting for? Let's do it. So, so that's the one thing I found is more powerful than anything. So Frank, I think that all our, all our listeners should actually take note of that. And I want to share with you some of the dialogue at the moment that I'm having agents tell me is getting great cut through. And that is, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Vendor, we totally understand that they're crazy times and you'd rather wait till things were more permanent. But I want to let you know, some of our smartest vendors are listing now and launching later. And the benefits of that is that you can pick up a buyer right now where there is little stock. So you're selling in isolation. And if we haven't sold, you've got a three or four week advantage on all your marketing being ready. So we're actually going to beat the race when all the other stock comes onto the market. And Frank and Maria, I've got to say that once they actually take the one step, right, and then they realise, man, it's not so daunting, right, you know, like we have did that, and then they do the next step, and then Maria goes off and gets some nice marketing done and says, have a look at how good the photos look here, right? Um, how about we just, you know, upload it up to REA and see what happens there? And I reckon in this market, there's a good chance you can have that property sold with just a few buyers looking at it. Everything I've put on the market during COVID is sold, and I've done a few. Um, 
The other thing is, is that, uh, you know, I, I tell my vendors that if we're ready, we're in control. We control your campaign and your marketing. So we don't have to sell it now. COVID's a great excuse to be on the market for a longer period of time if you really want to be, but we've got control. Mm. And, now, I, and I found every time I'm getting massive offers and selling. So we've got a few things coming on here. Sid Elias says that he's been using that strategy and it's working. We've also got a question coming from Stuart Bath, who says, great webinar, Maria. Can you please tell us what information goes into the pre-list kit? So, so what is the stuff that you take with you that you show at the at the table there? Okay, so in my pre-list kit, um, there's a, a core logic um, report. Obviously, it's all stats and stuff because, again, I don't know who I'm with at the moment. So I like to make sure that in my pre-list kit, I'm covering all personality types, okay, because everybody has a different personality. Some people are visual, some people are statistical. So I try and make sure that my pre-list kit covers everyone so that I'm speaking their language. So there's that. I put in uh, my recent sales. I put in an example of a brochure in our marketing. So one thing that I think, uh, I think everybody out there needs, and, and this is something time has given me as well, because obviously I've been in this industry a, a little while, but everybody has to have a point of difference. And you need to find what yours is because everyone's going to be different. My point of difference is, like I said, I'm very psychological and I feel that everybody has a different personality and I want to be able to communicate with each person on their level. So what I provide in my marketing is not just a brochure. So if you come through one of our open homes, you're not just getting a brochure. What you're getting is a brochure and then I have a second document called a technical and features guide, which literally names everything in the house from the curtains to the blinds to the, you know, to, to all of the fancy appliances, everything's noted in that from room to room. It's a document that takes a lot of time to prepare, wow. but it's the document that I think um, helps. When I say to my clients, this, is, this document's going to help you get highest price. Nothing's for free. So if you name all these things in the buyer, in the vendor's, in the buyer's mind, they're immediately adding value and negotiating with themselves without me opening my mouth. Yeah. The third document I provide is what we call why we love living here. So that's the emotional document. And I tell my clients that the information in that document also needs to reflect what it's like to live in the suburb and in their house. So there's lots of out of area buyers. Those buyers are usually emotional people because they don't know what it's like to live there. And then obviously you've got your statistical recent sales, which just isn't something that's printed off RP data and shoved on a piece of paper. We analyze it so that it is actually a, a, a you know a comparable to what we've what we're what we're selling. That's my pack in essence, as well as a few other things. And I'm I go into my listing presentations with that information in all my pre-list kits. And I go through that and I explain that to my vendor. That's my point of difference. Um, and that's what I feel that, as I said, it's, it's what's, I think, given me my, my reputation now. It's a lot more work, but if you look at our fees, we should be working hard. I love that. Hey, Tom and Maria, that is so awesome. I absolutely love that. It's one of those things that's always popped into my head of the idea is you go, you go buy, you know, look for a car and they give you a, a magazine book this big with all of these different bells and whistles and everything. And then you go buy a home that's worth $3 million and you get a little A4 brochure. Yeah. Not, not at my opens. That's exactly what I tell my clients. So if it's a prestige property, it's like a booklet. Yeah, and, um, you know, the more information in it, the better. And that's that's my analogy I use to my clients. Why is it we go and buy a car and the brochures are glossy and they're full of every little detail? You, you, you want heated seats, you've got to pay for it. Yeah. If you want a heated floor in the bathroom, guess what? You're going to have to pay for it. So that's the analogy that I use. But I think if you can understand who is on the other side of you, if they're an accountant, they won't give a damn about the emotion. Yeah. You have to talk to them analytically. And I think that as a mature agent who can do that, that's where you start seeing your rewards in this business, I think. Um, and I think that's what's happened with me. Now, now Frank, I'm, a couple of, I want to make sure that we get through um, the uh, questions or chat responses that are coming yeah. through. Um, I find this has come from Mario Carboni. I find that in our market, there is an expectation. Oh, I love this. Before we go that, I'm going to plagiarize this. The fact is Sydney's in lockdown, but the buyers are not. I love that. That's so true. <laughs> That's That's so true. I like that. 
And then Mario says, I find that in our market, there is an expectation that you know what the property is worth on the day of the appraisal. We get very little opportunity to revisit or pitch the full proposal. Essentially, you need the full proposal and opinion of value there and then. Would love to know your work around. Listen, I'm going to pass that on to Maria, but I don't actually, Mario, if I agree with you, that would make us both wrong, I think. I don't totally agree with that, and I'll tell you why, because I think that one of the bits of information that you don't have at the time of the listing presentation is the true intel of the current buyer in the market and how they view that property versus other properties on the market at that time. And I've got to tell you, as an auctioneer, I will often, I will often go to a vendor during an auction that we might be short 100 grand, 200 grand, and I'll say, guys, the good news is we now know what your home's worth. We didn't know what it was worth exactly four weeks ago. The good news is we now know what it's worth. So I actually think, Mario, my approach and the approach that I recommend agents to do is to spend more time talking about marketing, the process, the strategy, and less time trying to be the perfect valuer, right? In fact, I would suggest that tiptoeing around the price, giving hope, talking about comparables, talking about an emotional and a probable and a bargain hunter price and sort of showing the vendor we're aiming for this price. So I don't think you have to lock yourself in on a price, but Maria, I'll hand that over to you and see what your approach is. Yeah. Firstly, never do I give a price on my first time going in. I always like, I sell probably at least 50% of, of my marketplace here. Um, so if anyone's going to know prices, it'll be me. Um, but I will still never give someone a price on the first on the first time I've just met them. Um, that first time you go into a house is when you're actually fact finding and trying to understand who you're with. I don't ask what they want either because I'm not a yes agent. I'm not going to sit here and um, and be the agent that gets you what you're hoping for. I'd rather go to my own conclusions from my own research. Um, so yeah, so I think that. You know, and, and I'll say to a vendor, you, you know, if, if their expectations are higher than mine, it'll be, well, you know, like you said, the market will dictate the price. I'm not here paying for your house. What I'm here to do is see this list of things we need to do. If we follow all these and dot our I's and cross our T's, we will, have, we will give you the best opportunity we can to then get that highest price. So I, again, I, I, my, my appraisal is not on price. It's probably the last thing that I'll talk about. It's if we do all the right things and if we get the people here and we get the competition, then that's going to dictate the value. But this is the strategy and this is how we do it. Yeah, and Frank, I'll say one of the things that I'd love people, you know, watching this webinar is to actually change their mindset and actually see it as a positive about not locking in on price. I mean, there's a lot of pressure to everyone, to a vendor to say, we've got to get your price right today at a listing presentation. That's unnecessary pressure. The truth is you don't have to get the price right at the listing presentation, right? To be a bit cheeky, I've gone into some houses and gone, yeah, that's where we sit. Because at the moment, it's a bit like that. You know, you can't. How do you pick it? It's a moving target at the moment. So, you know, again, I like to sort of be a little bit lighthearted with clients as well. And sometimes I do. I just go, mm, yeah, I think we're here, you know. <laughs> Mario, Mario, Mario now agrees. He's, he's converted. And I think, uh, Mario, you're going to laugh your head off. One of the funniest things that's ever happened is I, I did a, I, I, I was doing an auction and the guy goes to me, mate, Tom, mate, really, you know, we really need, we really need to get three million because when we leave Newtown, we're moving to Hunters Hill. And Hunters Hill, they're on the water, they're really expensive. And I just smiled at him and I said, Well, here's my advice. When you get to Hunters Hill, make sure the person you buy from is not moving to Vaucluse because prices are really expensive there. <laughs> <laughs> he just laughed. I think he wanted to punch me in the face because he <laughs> saw the logic. Now, Frank, I'm going to hand over to you. Oh, there was one more yeah, question. One more question, yeah. Danny, Danny says, great webinar. How many daily contacts do you make and do you get much vendors resisting to speak with you 
as they know why you are calling. So it's got really not that much to do with a listing presentation, but it's more to do with, you know, the role of an agent staying in contact with people in their pipeline. Have you got a number, Maria? Do you, do you measure how many people you've got to speak to? We had this conversation yesterday, Tom. <laughs> I'm one agent who has no KPIs. You ask me how many properties I've sold, I wouldn't know. Um, I have to have my head office tell me what my figures are. So I'm definitely not an agent who goes by numbers. I go by feel. Um, so, you know, call me emotional. Maybe that's what I am. But um, I think that, you know, if you've, number one, if you're going to make calls, make sure you're feeling 100%. Make sure you're bouncing off the walls because your energy is going to then come through to whoever's on the other end of the line. Um, and, you know, it, it give them something. Um, I'm lucky that, that, you know, if I make a phone call, most of my area has my number in their phone and they're sort of going, oh, it's great to hear from you. Mm -hmm. But that takes hard work. So we've all got to remember that this isn't a short term um, strategy. It's not a short term career. Um, if you stick to it, if you do all the right things and if you do the hard work, it will repay itself. Um, but you know, if if you're not if you're feeling like crap, if you're feeling down about COVID, don't don't pick up the phone and ring anyone. Um, go for a walk or go do some exercise or go do something. But if you if you are ringing someone, and I love turning someone around when they're on the phone and they they don't want to speak to you, and then all of a sudden you're giving them some information or something that's obviously sort of gone. Oh, okay, well that's interesting. And it doesn't always have to be about sales. It's general conversation. It's general well being. So sometimes I think we need to think about the person and the people that we're dealing with rather than, you know, the whole numbers game. Well said. Look, there's a couple of more questions there and I'll just quickly finish up because I'm mindful of time. But, you know, Danny, to that question about the number of contacts, I think what's really important because it actually answers a little bit of the question of number from Lorraine Pointer as well on a percentage, how many sign now and how many sign in six in selling in six months. Um, so here's, here's the deal, Danny. If you're calling, look, Maria's business is an attraction-based business. Yeah. The truth is most of the conversations she's having are with people that are called have mets. She's actually met them before, right? She's been around. And I've got to tell you, the success rate of a have met to having a conversation and being a strong conversation is a lot better than a have not met. The have not mets are the people that are sitting in your database Sometimes you don't even know why they're there. There's just this name and email, right? It's, I don't know, it's some guy that might have a lawn mowing business in, you know, Bundaberg and they're somehow in your database. Obviously, the quality of the conversation that you're going to have with a have not met that's not qualified is quite different to someone that has been watching, you know, Maria sell property in Seaforth, saw the signboard at the public school, right? Difference. So you've got to always understand the difference between a have met and a have not met. And to the question from Lorraine on a percentage, how many do you sign now and how many sign up in six months? So I think, Maria, the question there is, so often you'll go to a listing presentation and then you work out once you're there, they're actually not coming onto the market for some time, right? Um, so you're going to both immediate seller appointments and some future seller appointments. Um, yeah. Do you normally work that out at the property or do you normally work that out on the phone before you get there? Um, I try and work that out before I get there, to right. be honest, um, so that I know what I'm in for. And if it's not, it's at the first appointment. Um, I won't sign something up if they're selling in six months unless they're open to looking at offers now. Um, again, when I sign my agency agreements, um, you know, I, I, I ask them how long they want me to sign up for. I don't sit there and go, it's got to be three months, it's got to be six. It's like, what would you like me to sign you up for? Because if someone's not happy and if I'm not doing the right thing, I don't want them to stay. Um, you know what I mean? I've never had anyone, I've had expired agencies before and never had anyone cancel me. So, again, it's how you do things. For the young ones out there and the ones that have just started in the industry, one, one tip that I'll give you that I think sort of helped me when I was spring chicken many years ago, um, when we're back doing opens, Go to whatever open houses you can, okay? So whether it's with, you know, your principals, other agents in the office, put your hand up and be that person who's going to take names and numbers or, you know, move the garbage bins, whatever the case may be. Make sure you're at as many open houses as you can because the public, if they see, you know, if they see a rainwater open house and you're there, they're not going to, they're going to assume you as being that person selling the house, even if you haven't. 
but that's where you're going to meet people and then they'll remember you. So you've just got to continually be out there and sitting and, and having your face shown. An agent shouldn't be sitting at home on a Saturday, even if they have no listings. They should be out helping their colleagues at their open houses. That's what I really believe. It's what I did. Um, I would, I'd be at any open house. Um, you know, if someone wanted help, I'd put my hand up. I'd be the one there to help them, even if it was just watering the garden, whatever the case may be, because then the buyers and the, the locals and whoever, they're seeing you there and they're constantly seeing you there. So that that's how you start building yourself um, as being someone that they'll remember. And you, Maria, it reminds me many years ago when I was listing and selling real estate, Cary Street, Marrickville. I remember exactly what you just said there. I had no listings and I had this one property. So what I did is I opened it on a Saturday from nine till 10, then I opened it from 12 to one, and then I opened it from three to four. And there was only marketing only for the one inspection, right? I'd only done one, but I thought to myself, I can sit here in the office and do nothing, or I can actually just be at the property with the signboards at the top of the street, at the end of the street, and I'll never forget it. A lady walked in that was two doors around. She didn't come to the morning inspection. She didn't come to the uh, uh, lunchtime. She came to the afternoon inspection. She walked in and she eventually put her home on the market three months later. She just walked there because she saw the signboard. So I think just immerse yourself in your community. Don't immerse yourself in the office. Work happens out with the people. Listen, we've gone over, Frank. That was outstanding, Maria. Congratulations. Awesome. Stay healthy. Um, Frank, is there anything you want to add? Thank you no, again, Frank, no, no. for a uh, real really good. Lots of good Yeah, presenting this. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. That was really, really great. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for attending. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot. Stay safe. See you next month. See you later. Bye.